Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark. From the fourth chapter, beginning in the 30th verse. Listen closely for God's word to you. Jesus also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? Like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up, it becomes the greatest of all shrubs, it puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we might hear a familiar word fall afresh upon our spirit today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, may they be acceptable unto you, for you, O Lord, You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Nadia Bowles Weber is the pastor of House of All Sinners and Saints, a relatively new Lutheran congregation just outside Denver. Before she was ordained, Nadia worked as a stand-up comedian I've heard her tell pastors that they should all get training as stand-up comics at some point in their life. She knows the art of storytelling, the craft of delivering a good joke. She wrote recently about parables and the humor that is to be found in these beloved sayings of Jesus. Here's what she says. We don't have to go far to find interpretations of parables that seem to suggest that parables can be solved. And once solved, they can offer us, quote, instructions for living. But parables aren't neat little moralisms dressed in narrative. Parables are meant to be swallowed whole. Parables are living things meant to mess with our assumptions and subvert things we've never even thought to question. They are more like jokes than anything else. And as you know, to explain a joke is to make it no longer funny. If you've ever tried to tell a joke, had no one laugh, and then proceed to explain why it is funny... then you know exactly what she's talking about. Indeed, over time, we have tended to take the funny out of parables. We have treated parables less like living things and more like Rubik's cubes. Work them long enough, twist them, turn them upside down, sideways, backwards, forwards, eventually you will have solved the puzzle. And over the years, some of the parables of Jesus have become so familiar that we have begun to solve them even before we have finished reading them out loud. Parable of the mustard seed? Yes, tiny seed grows large. Bibles closed. Puzzles solved. Unless you're willing to let Jesus make you laugh, even in church. So let me break Nadia's rule and explain his joke, (laughs) hoping that you might find the humor, but more importantly, the irony in what Jesus is saying. There's a symbol found throughout the Old Testament, especially in the Prophets, A symbol that describes the greatness of God and a time when God will deliver God's people. 
It's the symbol described in the passage that Jody read just a few moments ago. Ezekiel says, On the mountain height of Israel I will plant it, and it will become a noble cedar. This symbol of strong and mighty cedars representing the hopeful future of God would have been as familiar as a symbol for God's kingdom in the time of Jesus as the bald eagle is a symbol of freedom in our country today. So knowing a little bit of the background of the symbol of the cedar tree, go back to the parable of the mustard seed. Jesus says rhetorically, Knock, knock. With what shall we compare the kingdom of God? Well, that's easy. We will compare the kingdom of God to the mighty cedars of Lebanon, his students would have said. Of course, we will compare the kingdom of God to something that stands over the land and casts a shadow as far and wide as anyone can see. Of course, we will compare the kingdom of God to something so powerful that when the kingdom comes, all people will know that God has done a great and wondrous thing. So Jesus says, well, the kingdom of God is like a shrub. The greatest of all shrubs. <laughs> but a shrub. He says it's like when you start with a mustard seed and it turns into a shrub and the shrub grows everywhere. Now, what's more, at the time of Jesus, putting mustard seed into the ground wasn't exactly like planting tulips in your garden. You know a thing or two about mustard seed. Mustard gets everywhere. It's an invasive species of shrub. Once it's on your land, you can hardly get rid of it. Pretty soon, it will take over everything. So it is as if Jesus says this to us today. How shall I describe the greatness of God? Is it like purple mountains majesty above the fruited plain? Is it like the giant sequoias of California? Is it like the rush of the whitewater rapids of the Colorado River? Is it like the Washington Monument towering over the nation's capital? No, Jesus says the reign of God is like kudzu. It's like kudzu. Once God is in your life, it can take over everything. Once God is in charge, everything is in play. Now you can see the humor in this parable. This image that Jesus uses is completely unexpected and ironic, yet delivers a point. Much like the great Irish storytellers can draw you in and deliver a joke just at the right time, or even Shakespeare with a turn at the end of his sonnets. And so Jesus says, if you like that little joke, then try a few others on for size. You know the one about the father, the father who gave his inheritance to his son, Yeah, you know the one. The son takes his inheritance, squanders it in in prostitutes and blackjack, loses everything, has to eat out of the pig slop at night. And so you know what the father does in return. (laughs) He throws him a party. He takes the ring off his finger and puts it on his, the shirt off his back and puts it on his, takes the fatted calf and slaughters it. Jesus says that's what it's like when God welcomes you home. Or the one about the shepherd, the hundred sheep. You know the one, he left the 99 somewhere when one was lost. He left the 99, went and found the sheep. And when he found the lost sheep, did he go back to the flock? No, he went home and threw a party. He said, look, the lost has been found. Jesus says that's what it's like when you're lost. And I find you. Or the best one yet, you know the one about the guy who was left for dead on the highway from Jericho to Jerusalem. He was beat up, left for dead. He was dirty, so everybody passed by. And the clergy, 
They didn't want to get their stoles near him and the attorneys in their fancy suits, they wouldn't go near him either. So eventually someone came and found him and helped him and you know who that was. Yeah, it was a Samaritan. Jesus says, life in me is to know that even Samaritans are your neighbors. Here's what Nadia says, imagining the reaction of the people to hearing about the kingdom of God like an invasive shrub. She says, I can see everyone's jaw dropping, totally offended, while one awkward guy in the back pew laughs. He laughs out loud before realizing that no one else thinks it's funny, but he knows it's funny. He knows it's funny because it's true. And that's why parables don't come to us like Rubik's Cubes to be solved. Parables come alongside us and invite us to laugh at what God is doing. Not to laugh because we think what God is doing is funny, but we laugh because we know God is doing Not to laugh because we think what God is doing is funny, but we laugh because we know that God is doing. Earlier this spring, towards the end of our Wednesday Bible study, I passed around an article published in a Christian century by Craig Barnes, president of Princeton Seminary, who preached here last year and delivered our burger lecture. Craig wrote in the century as a seminary president how he often has the opportunity to meet with students who are considering their call, considering their vocation, asking him to tell them what God is doing in my life. He writes this, Some students are clear about what they must do and just need advice on how to do it. Others struggle with the whole notion of calling. They talk in circles, show me their journals, and offer exegesis of their Myers-Briggs personality types. We pray, but they leave my office without either of us getting a glimpse of a burning bush. He says, a vision from God doesn't have to arrive through a supernatural revelation. The call can be stuck in a theology textbook abandoned after a final exam. It can arise through a late-night conversation with friends or on a trip to the West Bank. He says, my wife once heard Nat King Cole sing, O Holy Night, on the radio. When he started singing till he appeared and the soul felt its worth, he started crying. Because heaven is inflaming bushes around us all the time. The question is, are we paying attention? The question is, are we paying attention? A few days ago, Sarah and Hannah and I returned from a wonderful trip to England. And like all preachers, returning from vacation in the middle of the week when the wheels go down, Sunday starts to come on my mind. With thoughts of writing a sermon, I went to my favorite place to write sermons, which is the quiet room on the second floor of the Rockville Public Library. You didn't hear me say that. As I pulled out my iPad and began to write, a man walked into the quiet room who was not being quiet. (laughs) He was pulling a handcart with several bags behind him, wearing multiple layers of clothing on a morning that had already reached well into the 80s. I was upset that the Wi-Fi was slow, my iPhone wasn't charged, I was frustrated that I felt rushed and didn't have time to prepare. 
Then he slowly and noisily began to set up in the chair right next to me. (laughs) I was distracted, and I will confess to being upset. The plastic bags were making noise, and he kept clearing his throat. So now he had my full attention. (laughs) Then he began to methodically pull out from his bag DVDs. DVDs that said, Learning Pre-Algebra. He pulled out a little portable DVD player and a pair of old headphones and quietly began to watch and take notes. He was obviously trying to learn math all on his own with just a few mustard seeds. And he didn't have to say anything. He didn't say anything. He just sat and watched a video and took notes on a jam-packed notebook that looked like he had been doing this for a long time. And you know what I did? I laughed. Not because it was funny that he was homeless and studying algebra. Not because it was funny that there are people in our community who are homeless and need to study algebra. Not that it's funny that on a day that would reach 96 degrees, he wore all of his clothing on his back. I laughed because as I was feverishly trying to explain a parable, God was creating one. A parable about privilege and perspective. About finding words about Jesus and seeing Jesus show up. About the one who says, you welcome me when you welcome the least of these. Sometimes the burning bush is inflamed so brightly before us that all we can do is laugh. Well, I laughed because the kingdom of God, Jesus says, is like kudzu. God will do whatever it takes to get a hold of you. On the second floor quiet room of the library or on a cross. Because it's not about solving the parable. Indeed, Jesus says, let the parable solve you. Perhaps that's why Martin Luther would teach his students this way about the Lord's Prayer. Martin Luther would say, What does it mean to pray, Thy kingdom come? Luther said, God's kingdom will come of its own whether we pray for it or not. In this prayer, I ask that God's kingdom would come to me. Jesus says, how shall I describe the kingdom of God? His answer, it's like a pastor who went to write about parables of the kingdom of God and found himself in the middle of one.